Yeah, conditions return for much of England and Wales, and it's a mild start to Wednesday here, 12 Celsius in the south, 8 to 10 further north. But there is an area of rain that threatens from the southwest early Wednesday. Of course, we need some rain in the south. This won't give a huge amount of rain for most, and its track is a little uncertain at the moment, but it's likely to bring some damp weather to parts of Wales, the Midlands, into southern England. That clears away for Thursday and Friday, turning drier in the south, whilst showers continue in the north. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. No spin, no bias, no censorship. I'm Dan Wooten tonight. Backed into a corner by his own hypocrisy, Keir Starmer has pledged to step down if he's slapped with a beer gate fine. If the police decide to issue me with a fixed penalty notice, I would, of course, do the right thing and step down. But why has the oh-so-moral Labour leader included that caveat after holding Boris Johnson to lesser standards? I'll explain why Bear Starmer should already be gone if he's truly as honest and decent as he claims. That's my digest next. Then I'll get the reaction of my superstar panel, the Daily Express columnist Carol Malone, senior reporter at the I newspaper Benjamin Butterworth and broadcaster Bev Turner. Lots more expert analysis of Bear Gate coming thick and fast throughout the night too. Tory grandee David Mallow will take aim at Starmer's hypocrisy at 10.20. Then The Sun's legendary political columnist Trevor Kavanagh breaks down why Starmer has lost all sense of right and wrong in Uncancelled at 10.40. Plus, as Lisa Nandy refuses to rule out a bid for the top job, who should run Labour in order to give Britain the opposition leader it deserves? My panel will reveal their choices at 10pm. Elsewhere on the show, does Sinn Féin's victory put the union under threat? To battle all this out, I've got a former Sinn Féin Assembly member, a former DUP MP and Conservative peer, Lord Daniel Moylan. I'll get your verdict too in the clash at 9.20. Has Sweden's lockdown strategy been vindicated? Positive Professor Carol Sakura analyzes the new stats that vindicate an approach maligned by the MSM. That's at 9.30. As he's talked up as a potential new Tory leader, should we be concerned about Jeremy Hunt, who expressed admiration for global COVID authoritarians? Should we be concerned about him becoming PM? Should be aiming for zero infection um, and elimination of the disease. Neil Oliver tackles that in The Outsider at 
And as the establishment finally admits concern over vaccine side effects, was it wrong to demonise critics, including our very own Bev Turner, for comments like this? Why, are you, why do you want to put a 22-year-old with her whole life ahead of her as part of a clinical trial when we do not know the long-term implications? That and more coming up in the Media Buzz at 10.30. Tomorrow's newspaper front pages will be landing throughout the show too. And I'll crown the first greatest Britain and Union jackass of the week at 10.50. This is Dan Watson tonight. Let's go. Just one thing first, though. Sad breaking news this evening. The Queen will not be able to attend the state opening of Parliament tomorrow, with Buckingham Palace blaming, quote, episodic mobility problems. Prince Charles will read the Queen's speech, with Prince William also in attendance. Feels like a sad end of an era that none of us want to accept is coming. Some more positive news, though, for Her Majesty, who today becomes the third longest reigning monarch in history. She surpassed Prince Johann II of Liechtenstein, who reigned for 70 years. She's still behind Louis XIV of France, who reigned for 72 years and 110 days, and King Pumi Pon Udu Lia Divi of Thailand, who racked up 70 years and 126 days on the throne. But in just 34 days, the Queen will beat the former Thai King to become the second longest reigning monarch in history. So stay strong. Your Majesty. Right, the Beargate scandal from every angle. Tonight, my digest in just a moment, then my superstar panel weigh in. Let's have a look at them. The Daily Express columnist Karen Malone is here. So too, senior reporter at the iNewspaper, Benjamin Butterworth, and the broadcaster, Bev Turner. But on a very busy news day, Tamsin Roberts is keeping us up to date with the latest. Dan, thank you. Good evening from the GB Newsroom. Prince Charles will deliver the speech at the state opening of Parliament tomorrow after it was confirmed the Queen will not attend. It'll be the first time the monarch has not been at the Westminster event in nearly 60 years. In a statement, Buckingham Palace says Her Majesty continues to experience episodic mobility problems and, after speaking with her doctors, has reluctantly decided to pull out. The Duke of Cambridge will also be attending in her place. Sakir Starmer has said he will step down as Labour leader if he's fined by police. It's after an investigation was launched into allegations he broke coronavirus rules at a curry and beer gathering in Durham in April last year. Labour's deputy leader, Angela Rayner, who was also at the event, has said she will also quit if fined, but insists no rules were broken. Sakir says he has always followed the rules. The first group of illegal migrants will be told this week of government plans to send them to Rwanda. The Home Secretary says those who cross the channel will be among those to be deported to the East African nation. Priti Patel says the government has the power to detain those individuals pending their removal from the UK. The first flights are expected to take off in the coming months. DUP leader Sir Geoffrey Donaldson says his party will not form an executive until the UK government takes action over the Northern Ireland Protocol. Just a warning, there are some flashing images in this next footage. Sinn Féin's deputy leader, Michelle O'Neill, says it's Boris Johnson and the EU's responsibility to find solutions to the protocol, but that Northern Ireland will not be held to ransom by them. The would-be First Minister said the British government and the DUP must accept the result of the Assembly election. It's after Sinn Féin became Stormont's largest party, winning a historic 27 seats last Thursday. A car has crashed into the Prime Minister's house in South London. The black Vauxhall Astra drove into the front garden of the property in Camberwell in the early hours of this morning. The vehicle damaged hedges and a tree and knocked down a small pillar in the front of the house. TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Dan Whitten tonight. Backed into a corner by his own hypocrisy, double standards and rule-breaking, Keir Starmer tried to claim back the moral high ground over Beargate today. 
but spectacularly failed. We all found the rules frustrating at times, and I'm no exception to that. I had to isolate six times during COVID, pulling me away from my work and the things that I love. But I did it because we followed the rules. The idea that I would then casually break those rules is wrong. I'm absolutely clear that no laws were broken. They were followed at all times. I simply had something to eat while working late in the evening, as any politician would do days before an election. But if the police decide to issue me with a fixed penalty notice, I would, of course, do the right thing and step down. Big problem with that. Starmer knows there is virtually no chance of Durham Police issuing him a fine. They have a policy, an official policy, not to hand out retrospective fixed penalty notices for lockdown breaches. Even Dominic Cummings didn't receive one for his obvious rule-breaking flight of fancy to Barnard Castle. So the key question is, will Starmer resign if the police find he breached the lockdown rules, which, based on the evidence, I am utterly convinced that he did. Well, when asked that question today, Slippery Starmer, of course, refused to commit. Given what you've said about the Prime Minister, you'd have no option but to resign. So what, my first question is, why did it take you so long to arrive at that position? No rules were broken. I've been absolutely clear about that from start to finish. Um, and I've set out today the in-principle position that I believe in, unlike those at Downing Street, I don't think those that make the laws can then simply breach them um, and not uh, take action. I believe that if you've made a law, you should respect the law, and if you're found to be in breach of it, you should step down. And that's what I've set out clearly this afternoon. OK, so let me follow this. He'll stay as leader, even if he is found in breach of the laws, exactly what he's attacked Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak for. Indeed, if Starmer were to follow his own standards for the Prime Minister, he should have resigned on Friday afternoon, the moment Durham Police announced its investigation. That's because on the 31st of January, before Boris had even been issued with a thing, Starmer vented on Twitter. Honesty and decency matter. After months of denials, the Prime Minister is now under criminal investigations for breaking his own lockdown laws. He needs to do the decent thing and resign. Well, if honesty and decency mattered, as Starmer suggested in that tweet, he would have already admitted wrongdoing. The Labour Party's tissues of lies over beers with care has collapsed over the past two weeks. A bombshell memo released by the Mail on Sunday yesterday proved the curry night was pre-planned. In stark contrast to Starmer's claim, he simply stopped for a bite to eat. The Labour Party had already been forced to admit it lied over the attendance of the party's deputy leader, Angela Rayner, at the gathering, who today also confirmed she will quit if issued with a fixed penalty notice. Attendees at the event have poured scorn on Starmer's public claims. They went back to work after the curry and beer party with Politico, reporting today that many there were drunk and obviously not working. Starmer also claimed publicly the curry night was needed because the restaurants and pubs were closed in Durham that night, when that's provably untrue. Many were open, but you had to eat outside. Heaping further shame on Starmer, the former director of public prosecutions, of course, is the unenvious position he's now put the Durham police. Here's what one of the country's top barristers, Francis Hoare, told my colleague Colin Brazier this evening. The important thing here is that Sir Keir Starmer has firstly undermined the important principle that the police do not decide whether or not somebody is innocent or guilty. And secondly, the, secondly, the, the, the presumption of innocence, he's undermined that, in my view, um, by saying what he did, indicating that he would agree to whatever the police decide. And thirdly, he has put deeply inappropriate pressure on the Durham Constabulary by saying that he will resign depending upon what they decide. None of these are appropriate for a leader of, uh, of the opposition, and they're particularly inexcusable for the ex-DPP. By the way, don't give Starmer any credit for facing the media today. GB News, which has been on this story since the start, was banned from today's press briefing, 
as was every national newspaper, including the Daily Mail, which put the story on its front page for seven days in a row last week. And look at this bizarre moment, truly bizarre, when Starmer started to take questions from the three hand-picked journalists allowed into the room by the Labour Party, ITV's Libby Wiener, the BBC's Ben Wright and Sky News political editor Beth Rigby. I'll now take questions. I think, Beth, we've agreed you'll go first. So we're now in Joe Biden territory, folks, where friendly journalists are pre-selected to ask a question of Starmer. What a disgrace. And shame on those three news organisations that allowed for such a corrupt setup. But of course we shouldn't be at all surprised. The BBC, ITV News and Sky News were obsessed with the Partygate story. Obsessed. They covered it breathlessly for months on end because they thought it could bring down Boris Johnson. But they have absolutely zero interest in pursuing original journalism on Beargate because they're in the tank for Starmer who, let's be honest, is one of them, a Brexit-hating member of the London Liberal Metropolitan Elite. I don't think anyone should have to resign for breaking the COVID rules, which were totally moral, completely inhumane. I was proud to break them. But I am asking for consistency when it comes to the coverage of these two scandals. Beargate has not only exposed Keir Starmer as a dishonourable hypocrite, it's exposed the deeply ingrained bias of the British broadcast media. To respond now, my superstar panel. Columnist for the Daily Express, Carol Malone. Senior reporter at the I newspaper, Benjamin Butterworth. And broadcaster, Bev Turner. Carol Malone, this is a farce, isn't it? This is a complete <laughs> farce because he's said that he'll resign if he will get a fixed penalty notice, knowing full well that the Durham police have a policy not to issue them retrospectively. And he knows full well that the police commissioner in the Durham area is a good friend of his. He helped get her elected. Um, you know, there's pictures of him posing together saying, elect Helen, I forgot my surname. Anyway, um, you know, this is a mess entirely of his own making. If he hadn't been quite so self-righteous, quite so sanctimonious, quite so loud in screaming for Boris's resignation on this, I suspect he might actually have got away with it. But, you know, it's interesting, Dan Hodges wrote a piece in the, in the Mail on Sunday, and he said he, he reminded us of a quote that when, when he was at when Starmer was first elected, he, uh, he was asked what qualities he shared with Boris Johnson, and he said his quote was, I'm not like Boris Johnson in any respect. There is nothing that the two of us have in common. Well, there is now, because he <laughs> had, And I just, I don't understand why he allowed the last two weeks to happen, why he's let all this go on and on and on. And now, to be me, he looks like a total and utter fool. He has zero credibility. And I think your, your last report was right. He has put undue pressure now on Durham police because they will be... Because if they fine him, a Labour leader will resign. And, and I just think that's... I, I think it's really bad of him. I think, I think he's behaved appallingly. You know, the, the, you know he, he said today he still thought um, that he hadn't broken any laws. He knows he did because he knows that, that social events were forbidden. Mm. And he knows that night was planned well in advance, yeah. as was he the Curry Party. He broke the lockdown laws and he also yeah. broke the specific guidance that yes. was given for campaigning at the time. Yes. Benjamin Butterworth, look, I, I know this bloke is, is one of you. You know, he's part of the champagne quaffing, quinoa eating, <laughs> Islington set. I don't even like quinoa. Your mates, your friends. Surely even you cannot defend him today. Well, look, Keir Starmer is the son of a toolmaker and a dis dad and a disabled oh, mum from a working class Privately background. Privately educated. He's not, no, he, he got a scholarship halfway through his education. He's from a working class background, unlike a multi-millionaire, eaten educated Boris Johnson. That's so not I how will he not sells have himself. this lie that Keir Starmer is somehow the elite and Boris Johnson is the voice of the working man because it's complete nonsense. OK, so how are you going to defend him today for what he well, did? Well, because <laughs> it was investigated before... And they found no, he hadn't done anything. It, it was, was not, not investigated. It was looked into there before. Was not a it was not investigated. You've just, you've just given disinformation already. Not a not single interview do was I, carried out. Do I no talk one. or do, or do well, I just... Well, no, because you're, you're telling our you're telling truth. I'm, I'm not. I want to say a lie, but it is, a, it is a lie. He was not interviewed and he didn't look at any well, there was no the investigation. Video, and there, there was, was no... Investigation. Vi he didn't look at the video footage that was of the event. May I speak? No, well, you just don't say wrong things again. because So it was looked into before. And look, he's been very clear that he says that he followed the rules. And to say that it was a social event 
event is complete nonsense. But do you think he followed the rules? Yes, absolutely. Oh, you have you read the rules? Yes. You can't say it with a straight face. You can't. You, you can't, can't say it with a straight on. face. Because if the truth is, if you think that this is an example of him breaking the rules I do. because he had a beer and some curry while working, and the Labour Party has said tonight that they have evidence of the work went on until 1am on that night. The following Where week... Where is the evidence, then? They're providing it to Durham Police. Oh, They've announced that tonight. And so it's if interesting you... if they're also going to provide the evidence of the up to 30 young staff mm -hmm. members who were completely Except that the pissed, per, the per, in the words of Politico, on The beer. person that gave that quote to the Daily Mail has said that that wasn't correct. That and that on was the itinerary... What about the person who gave the quote to Politico? On the itinerary, dinner with Mary Foy. It was on the itinerary. Yeah, and there's absolutely nothing strange about the fact. As he I'm said it was I'm spontaneous. Sure, I, I'm sure when you're on, on, on trips about, you plan in your he dinner said, to your working day. That's a perfect normal thing to do. He said it and was the a truth spontaneous... Is, it was not the truth is, about the truth is that just because we were locked in our homes, the do not get the there. The very next week, Boris Johnson and ten members of his staff in the same area in Durham had pints without face masks stood next to each other. And no one, including the Labour Party, ever said that, that was a breach of the rules because oh. it was part of campaigning. And that is what Keir Starmer did. This was not someone having cheese and wine in a suitcase full of alcohol dragged from the co-op to not, Downing that Street. That was not Boris Johnson. That was, was his... It? That no. was not Boris Boris with the no, suitcase of that alcohol. That was the deputy editor he of was, the Sun. He was that not today there. said that Keir Starmer should go over hypocrisy. While strangely, they had a party on the same night. No, but he wasn't the deputy editor of the Sun at the time. <sighs> Bev Turner, look. No, I he was the Downing Street guy that, that took the suitcase of this wine. This whole thing is ridiculous. I, I understand that, but do you also understand why folk like me say Starmer held Boris Johnson mm. and Rishi Sunak to a standard that he is not prepared to accept for himself? For, for somebody like me, and I think you're probably in this camp as well, Dan, and you've said you were, who look at lockdown, and even during it, not in that early spring, but as we moved into summer, and it was quite obvious that we weren't all at more danger if we walked outside of our front door. These stories baffled the living daylights out of me. Why? The, I mean, the, the brag from Keir Starmer... I locked, I, I isolated six times. <laughs> As if he's proud of it. That's, and it brings it all <laughs> flooding back to me, like the craziness of yeah. the virtue signalling, of the looking over the fence and judging your neighbour if they weren't clapping the NHS. This BS has to end and we have to draw a line under it. I don't even want to really be discussing it because I think there are so many more important things to talk about. But I do understand how you're saying what well, this is now, what we do now with this information is how we judge these people as human beings. And I think what the conclusion we're all drawing is that they can't be trusted. Well, but I didn't trust them anyway. But that's exactly what, what Ben, I, 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 think, I think the problem is we, did, we didn't, we wouldn't want to talk about this if Starmer hadn't made such a big deal about Boris. It's, it's unimportant in the scheme of things now. It's two years ago. There are much more, many more yeah, important things. This is nothing this about a night this is, this is about It's not about that. This but is it, about Starmer making a but the truth Well, is, it's about this, honour and decency. And that's exactly and remember, what he Starmer has one, shown. He has shown oh, no honour and decency. Honour and decency. Honor they are all as bad as each other. Yeah. They are all as bad as each other. And the, the problem with this conversation yeah. is it is creating immense voter apathy. And we only yes. have to look at the poor turnouts at the council elections mm -hmm. this last week to realise that the implications of this are huge. But we have to somehow draw a line under it and we have to move on. They yes. are all I, a shower I, I, of shame. I, 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 agree, I agree with that. It should be the final nail in the coffin, by the way, of these elites who yeah. refuse to follow the rules themselves ever telling us to do... 100%. What, ..what to do with our own lives, with our own behaviour. I, I, I completely believe that. But the issue is that Starmer wanted to bring down a democratically elected Prime Minister over the fact he had a birthday cake mm. presented to him at number 10 Downing Street. He wanted to bring down a Chancellor of the Exchequer, who doesn't even drink, by the way, he's teetotal, who happened to be in that room when the birthday cake was brought in. So Starmer has brought all of this on himself. And tonight and, yeah. he's created some very difficult conversations in a police station because yeah. there will be police officers in that station tonight what will all they do? fighting yeah. amongst each other. Well, yeah. I'm a Labour supporter. He, I don't he has, he, he, I'm a conservative He's put the Durham I don't want police to you in know, a he's disgraceful put them in an position. Impossible position. I, I think That's it's just absolutely appalling what's going on. Because how can you have 10 days of the right wing media? pressuring Durham police to investigate. Then Keir Starmer does the decent thing and says, I'll and accept, the media and says, didn't, I'll accept didn't their results the and resign if they find me guilty. But and then you, the right-wing media, go, 
oh, but now he's pressuring them. Well, if the Daily Mail hadn't been obsessed with this, and people like you, as you proudly oh, declared, on. hadn't been obsessed Daily with Mail this, obsessed then Durham Police wouldn't all have had Daily this Mail story. Have done the Durham Police a wouldn't have the pressure good, in the first place. All the Daily Mail have done is a very good journalistic job. In fact, the Daily yeah. Mail have done the police's job don't, for them don't. in producing evidence so that why they are attacking them for pressuring Durham Police. Because at the end of the day, what Boris Johnson did was right. He said, I will Boris wait Johnson for the results right. of the police investigation yeah. and then I will make a decision. What Keir Starmer has done is said really? what he will do before the police investigation is complete. That puts because huge no, amounts of political pressure on the Durham police and it is a disgrace. But it's look, not, we're going to talk about not, this Keir Starmer's got a backbone, unlike the bloke in Downing Street. Oh, Benjamin Butterworth, Carol Malone, Bev Turner, my superstar panel, and they are here all night, folks. But still to come, after two years of MSM sneering, was Sweden's approach to COVID restrictions right all along? Well, Positive Professor Carol Sakura analyses these bombshell new stats, which very much make that case at 9.30. But up next, does Sinn Féin's victory put the union under threat? A former Sinn Féin Assembly member, a former DUP MP and a Conservative peer joined me in the clash. That's straight after the break. Very important subject. This is what do you think. Dan at GBNews.uk. Tweet me at GBNews. We've got our poll running there too. The results after the break. Hello again. I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. It's been a wet start to the week for Scotland and Northern Ireland. That rain is now sinking south. Sky's clearing behind it, but with further showers expected over the next few days for northern parts of the UK in particular. Low pressure towards the northwest is sending a couple of weather fronts southwards across the UK. Those weather fronts, as they bump into high pressure further east, weaken. But nevertheless, still a cloudy night to come for much of England and Wales. Increasingly damp conditions for northern England, the Midlands, Wales as well. That rain reaching the southwest by dawn. Otherwise, uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland see the rain clearing and clear spells, but with showers replacing it. Those showers particularly lively for the west of Scotland, along with a blustery breeze. 8 Celsius in Glasgow first thing, 14 for London, but a damp start for London as the cloud and rain slowly clear here. By lunchtime, most places sees, see brighter skies and there'll be some decent sunny spells in the south with highs here of 18 to 20 Celsius. Showers for Wales and Northern England, but some lively downpours for Scotland and Northern Ireland. The old rumble of thunder is possible with some of the heavier downpours and it'll feel cool 15 to 17 Celsius at best. Longer spells of rain arrive then for Tuesday night into the start of Wednesday for Scotland, Northern Ireland and Northern England, eventually turning back to showers. Cloudier conditions return for much of England and Wales and it's a mild start to Wednesday here, 12 Celsius in the south, 8 to 10 further north. But there is an area of rain that threatens from the southwest early Wednesday. Of course, we need some rain in the south. This won't give a huge amount of rain for most, and its track is a little uncertain at the moment, but it's likely to bring some damp weather to parts of Wales, the Midlands, into southern England. That clears away for Thursday and Friday, turning drier in the south, whilst showers continue in the north. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7 on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Frasier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. 
Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, but To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Positive Professor Carol Sikor and Neil Oliver on the way, but time now for The Clash. And tensions are reaching boiling point in Northern Ireland after a historic win by Sinn Féin at the weekend. The Nationalist Party, which wants a united Ireland, has become the largest instalment for the first time ever after winning 27 MLA seats in the Assembly election. But it's triggered a standoff with the biggest union group, the Democratic Unionist Party. A power-sharing system is in place where the two must work together, but the DUP leader today revealed they will not form a government with Sinn Féin until the Northern Ireland Protocol is scrapped. The controversial deal struck after Brexit, of course, ensured there would be no return to a hard border with the Republic of Ireland, but creates an effective border in the Irish Sea, something the DUP says undermines Northern Ireland's place in the UK. Sinn Féin's Michelle O'Neill, who stands to become First Minister if a government can be formed, lashed out at the delays earlier today. As Democrats, the DUP, but also the British government, must accept the, and respect the democratic outcome of this election. Brinkmanship will not be tolerated where the north of Ireland becomes collateral damage in a game of chicken with the European Commission. The responsibility for finding solutions to the protocol to make it smooth implementation lie with Boris Johnson and the EU. But make no mistake, we and our business community here will not be held to ransom. So while this is being celebrated as a huge victory for Sinn Féin, unionists still slightly outnumber nationalists in the Assembly and the vote showed mainly consolidation of the middle ground. Sinn Féin had no seat change while the DUP only lost two. But of course quick to seize any stick to beat the British government, scheming Nicola Sturgeon has waded in, fanning flames of fear about the future of the union. There's no doubt there are big fundamental questions being asked of the UK as a political entity right now. They're being asked here in Scotland, they're being asked in Northern Ireland, they're being asked in Wales. And I think we're going to see some fundamental changes uh, to UK governance in the years to come. And I'm certain one of those changes is going to be Scottish independence. So, with the historic win throwing Northern Ireland into focus, does Sinn Féin's victory put the union under threat? Dan at GBNews.uk, tweet me at GBNews, vote in our poll, but to help you make your mind up, former DUP MP Emma Little Pengerley, former Sinn Féin Assembly member Dahi McKay, and Conservative peer Lord Daniel Moylan. Emma Little Pengerley, this isn't so bad for unionists, you say? No, I think the problem here is being Sinn Féin spin, spin, spin. They went into this election, as you've said, with 27 seats. They've come out with 27 seats. They had a small increase in their vote of about 1%. Uh, and of course, they're trying to, to give this impression that this is a, a lurch towards Irish nationalism. But of course, when we look at the nationalist vote share uh, back in the first election after the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, the nationalist bloc uh, of the SDLP and Sinn Féin had about 39 percent of the vote. In 2022, Sinn Féin and the SDLP have 39 percent of the vote. 25 years, no advance uh, in the nationalist uh, cause. 
despite uh, some demographic change. So, you know, this isn't an indication that a United Ireland is around the corner. It wasn't a good election for the DUP, but the DUP had been warning about this for some time. The protocol is causing significant unhappiness on the ground across unionist and loyalist communities, and that is threatening the stability of peace in Northern Ireland and the stability of the institutions. We want to get back to Stormont. We want to make Northern Ireland work. But the reality is putting the border down the Irish Sea has caused serious ructions across the Innes community here. So, Dahi, Emma says this is spin, spin, spin by Sinn Féin. You say what? Well, I think the DUP, understandably, are, are in damage limitation mode because before the election, the DUP were saying that if there was a Sinn Féin first minister, that it would lead to further calls for a border poll and put the union further at risk. So, obviously, they have changed their position. That's totally understandable, but this is a significant moment in the, the history uh, of this state. It's the first time we've ever seen a nationalist uh, first minister uh, in this position. Uh, and I think that the DUP are in a difficult position. It's a bit of a catch-22. They either go in and work the institutions or they don't. And if they don't go into the institutions, they deny uh, nationalists a first minister. And of course, nationalists are deeply sensitive about issues around equality. And if they see that a nationalist is being locked out of that role, um, given the context, it's the first time they've ever achieved it, they will, will view that uh, with anger uh, and uh, frustration. Uh, and that will only result in greater support for Sinn Féin, I would say, uh, in the next election, if indeed we are going to go to another election uh, in the months ahead. So I think the DEP are in a difficult position. Uh, and if the Assembly doesn't come back, then that actually puts the union further at risk. Lord Daniel Moylan, the Sinn Féin, uh, Sinn Féin is probably in a difficult position too, though, as well as the DUP, because they're not calling for any sort of poll on a united island for another five years, because they know that the support is not there. Well, <clears throat> let me start by agreeing with Dahi, first of all. This is a significant moment. Uh, that Sinn Féin is entitled to claim the first minister mm -hmm. ministership under the current rules of the GFA. But as, as Emma pointed out, this is not because they've got bigger, it's because the unionist vote has split. So more unionist parties now in the Assembly. The union is absolutely safe. Michelle O'Neill is in danger of becoming a sort of Nicola Sturgeon sort of joke figure, constantly promising a referendum and Irish unification. It's all going to happen in the future. Where there isn't the slightest prospect in either country uh, that in the foreseeable future that there will be a majority for, for independence in the case of Scotland or for unification in the case of Northern Ireland. So the whole thing is completely bogus. The union is completely safe. And we can put that whole thought behind us now. Dahi, how do you respond to that? Well, I think it's a lot more nuanced than that. I mean, the Assembly now contains what we refer to as three minorities. So there is a unionist minority, there is an nationalist minority, uh, both of those are in around 41, 42% in terms of first preference votes. And you have others. And of course, there's many um, nationalists or people from a nationalist background who vote in these assembly elections for others because they don't see a vote for the, the in this election as, as, as a referendum vote or voting for, for unity. It's on bread and butter issues, it's on health, it's on abortion and issues such as it. But I do think that recent poll, and I think the, the latest Lord Ashcow, Icecroft poll had uh, support for Irish unity at 41% in the north, so that is a significant number. And it's actually in the same range as what the Leave uh, opinion polls were prior to David Cameron calling that referendum, and we all know what happened there. Um, so if a referendum is called, and if we have a couple of years to lead into that, so we have a mature discussion and a, a peaceful discussion is what we all want to see, then there's there's no reason why we couldn't see uh, a yes, well, yes. Being of, carried. of course it has to be peaceful. But Emma, I presume from a DUP point of view, you're banking on those polling numbers changing once the Northern Ireland Protocol is scrapped. Absolutely. I think there's two key issues here. The first is to try to stabilise unionism, and the only way that that can happen is to get this protocol resolved. But of course, unionists want to get this resolved not just because of the fracturing within unionism, but because unionists 
genuinely believe that putting a, a barrier internal right down the middle of your own internal market of the United Kingdom is fundamentally bad for the union. It doesn't make any sense. The European Union wouldn't do it. That's why they fought really, really hard to protect the integrity of their single market and internal uh, market. But of course, we've got a second issue here as well, which is the middle ground. As Dathi has mentioned, there's a growth of the Alliance Party. Um, now, these are people who are pretty agnostic about the constitutional question. They're content enough to be in Northern Ireland as part of the United Kingdom. They are voting to say, look, let's set the constitutional question to one side and get on with health, education, growing the economy, different aspects like that. Now, on one hand, that could be really positive for unionism because the vast majority then are people who are content within the United Kingdom. But if the economy of Northern Ireland does not work, if this protocol fundamentally impacts around consumer choice, around our businesses, which unionists fear it will when it actually is implemented because as we know, grace periods apply at the minute. There hasn't been that divergence in Great Britain that they can now do free from the single market and the customs union, that once that starts, Northern Ireland is going to be squeezed on the periphery of the United Kingdom, the periphery of the European Union. Uh, the economy is going to suffer. And then at that stage, people start to say, well, would we be better off in the Republic of Ireland as part of that European Union? We need to be very careful about that in order to protect the union as well. So, so Lord Daniel Boynton, what, what are the Tories going to do? I, I mean, I have no it idea. seems like we there is debate tomorrow. in Cabinet, but it's got to be scrapped, doesn't it? No, it has to I be scrapped. Not. We will find out tomorrow. Um, in the Queen's speech, which I believe is now going to be read by the Prince of Wales, yes. uh, we'll find out tomorrow what the government is going to do. And they have said they are going to put in a bill which will allow them to uh, disapply the Northern Ireland Protocol. And they've been reported in the Times as saying that they're not going to put that bill in. So we're going to find out tomorrow. There are obviously people, uh, a couple of people, particularly prominent people in the Cabinet, who have persistently tried to oppose dealing with this issue even though it does fundamental damage to our own country and it creates an undemocratic situation in Northern Ireland where people are living under foreign laws with no say, that the European... that in fact doesn't exist in any other European country and no other European country, including the Republic of Ireland, would accept. So it's got to be stopped uh, and the whole constitutional position, as I use the word constitutional, um, in relation to Northern Ireland needs to be addressed and it needs legislation to do it and I'm looking for the government to bring that forward, to announce that at least tomorrow, and then we'll see a bill some months later. That's what I'd like to see. Good stuff. That is the Conservative pair, Lord Daniel Moylan, the former DUP MP, Emma Little Pengerley, and the former Sinn Féin Assembly member, Dahi McKay. So who do you agree with on this? Well, Ricky on Twitter says, people assume Ireland wants reunification. Why would they? Of course, they pretend they do politically, but in reality, it's just a whole load of trouble for little gain. From James Thorpe, let them have Northern Ireland back. There's been enough blood spilled, and for what? And from Majority Voice, what's worse is that Nicola Sturgeon is now working with them to break up Britain. GB is being dominated by minority parties setting the agenda through media managers and spin merchants. Democracy is dead. And your verdict is now in. Well, it, it was a close vote. 51% of you agree that the Sinn Féin victory does put the union under threat. 49% of you think it doesn't. Fascinating stuff. We'll keep on this story. Coming up, could Zero Covid advocate Jeremy Hunt become the next leader of the Conservative Party? And shouldn't that terrify all of us? Neil Oliver and I discuss in The Outsiders soon. But first, has Sweden's lockdown strategy just been vindicated? Positive Professor Carol Sakura analyses the bombshell new stats that make uncomfortable reading for the Covid hysterics. We'll bring you those straight after the break. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debate, some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. 
On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Frasier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10am until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, but to the point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Neil Oliver and Trevor Kavanagh are coming up, but time now for our Positive Professor. And if pro-lockdown zealots haven't already realised their stance over the past years has been terribly cruel, these latest figures the World Health Organisation help kick their brain into gear. New hardest during COVID did little to hold back the death surge. Sweden which was widely slammed in the early stages of the pandemic for not implementing harmful lockdown rules, had fewer excess deaths per 100,000 people than most of Europe. Just 56 people per 100,000 died in Sweden over the last two years, compared to, for example, Germany's 116 per 100,000 under lockdown, militant Angela Merkel. So much for those who praised Germany for following the science. Boris Johnson led the UK to a rate of 109 deaths per 100,000 people, lower than 13 European countries, including Spain, Italy and Portugal. Peru had a staggering 437 deaths per 100,000, despite having some of the toughest lockdown restrictions in the world. Now, my lockdown inquiry on this show has already started unravelling the myth that lockdown saved lives. Now, though, the official data is clear. Lockdowns were truly harmful, and those who continue to say otherwise are irresponsible and wrong, and history will not look back kindly on them. Carol Sikor, our positive professor, has Sweden's lockdown strategy just been officially vindicated? Really, it has, Dan. There's no doubt. If you look across the countries, the, the only data you can take, because different people called COVID deaths differently. Uh, in some countries, in our country, for example, in the UK, it's any death within 28 days of positive testing for COVID. In Peru, strict lockdown and if you look at excess deaths per 100,000, that's the pure data that's completely comparable, as long as it's not fake. And there's no indication that it was fake. So if you look at that, Sweden comes out top dog. There's no doubt Sweden has done very well with its very mild lockdown, a sort of recommendation that those that feel vulnerable should isolate themselves, should avoid crowds, wear masks and so on. Here we had a sort of half-hearted lockdown. It wasn't totally enforced. In Peru it was. And you can see lockdown actually costs lives. And so the lesson, Dan, for the future is just don't do it like this for respiratory viruses. We've got to do something better. Indeed, Carol, in, indeed. And do you think there are lessons that now should be learned from Sweden as we go through these COVID inquiries around the world? Completely. And if you remember the Great Barrington Declaration, Great Barrington is a village outside Boston, Massachusetts in the US. And the idea there was you shouldn't lock down populations. You should take people that are vulnerable, older, 
uh, people with obesity, people with other medical illnesses that could result in severe COVID and get them to isolate, but not do whole populations. And that's the problem. So when you look at the complexity of the data, uh, overall mortality, excess mortality due to cancer, due to stroke, due to heart attacks and so on, you see the total picture. What we did here was completely incorrect and we were led by a group of epidemiologists that persuaded the politicians to do it in an extreme way. And we can't do that again. We've got to have a balanced healthcare approach to a pandemic. It's fascinating, isn't it, Carol? Because throughout the pandemic, you always wanted to try and focus on what we were good at, the positive news. But you know everyone in the media or the vast majority of the media wanted to do Britain down and talk about how badly we were doing uh, compared to other countries. Now that there are these figures out, no one's covering it, Carol. No one's talking about it. No one is saying Germany was worse than us, for example. I just find it really disturbing. Now, I think the worst thing, Dan, is the culture of fear that it's brought about. And you yeah. can feel it when you go on public transport, people are afraid. I mean, I, I remember a lady shouting at me because I hadn't got a mask. There was no need to have a mask. It wasn't part of the rules. And yet I was being shouted at on a train. And she went and sat on a seat about two rows ahead of me. And I, as though the virus would care whether she's two rows or one row ahead of me, it made absolutely no sense. People have their own belief systems. And I'm afraid we saw of got it wrong here and i think sweden really got it right self-responsibility you do what you think's best for you and the, the world moves with it and i think it's been tremendous to see this data and there'll be more data like this coming out as people put deeper analyses of the, the whole problem carol sakura brilliant analysis our positive professor thank you so much and carol will be back next week of course Coming up, though, as Lisa Nandy refuses to rule out a bid for the top job amid Starmer's troubles, who should run Labour in order to give Britain the opposition leader it deserves? We rate the top candidates in the media buzz after 10pm. The next, rumours are rife within Westminster about a certain former health secretary becoming the next prime minister. So should we be concerned about Jeremy Hunt, who expressed admiration for global COVID authoritarians leading the country? Neil Oliver is here to dissect that next in The Outsider. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wilson tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. A first look at how tomorrow's newspaper front pages are covering the Bear Gate scandal coming up. But first, Neil Oliver is tonight's outsider.
Now, Jeremy Hunt is reportedly already putting himself in the running to be the next leader of the Conservative Party if Boris Johnson is ousted. The ex-Foreign Secretary, who came second to Boris in the 2019 leadership contest, is believed to be lining up supporters and sounding out potential cabinet ministers in anticipation of the Prime Minister losing a confidence vote. Insiders say Hunt is poised to pitch himself to the public as a, quote, safe pair of hands after Johnson's turbulent time in Downing Street. And he's generally seen as not tainted by the government's handling of COVID. But let's not forget that he made huge mistakes during his stint as health secretary, leaving the UK unprepared for the incoming pandemic. And now a video from July 2020 has resurfaced and gone viral because it shows Hunt seemingly backing China's draconian zero COVID strategy. I very much agree with uh, the central point in, in Gabriel's paper that we should be aiming for zero infection um, and elimination of the disease, because that is basically the approach taken in countries which have a SARS strategy as opposed to a, a flu strategy. And those are the countries that have overwhelmingly been the most successful in, in tackling coronavirus. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, my sister uh, lives in Beijing and she flew back to Beijing in the middle of lockdown. And just to give you an, an idea of the contrast, uh, she was escorted from the airport in Beijing to her home by Ministry of Health officials. Uh, and then uh, put into her home for two weeks quarantine. The door was sealed and uh, she had a police car sitting outside her house uh, periodically. And I'm not saying we go that far in this country, but I just think it's an indication of how serious they are in the countries that have had to deal with SARS about stopping at the root every possible source of infection. Neil Oliver. Very disturbing stuff from Jeremy Hunt, who seems to be some sort of zero COVID enthusiast. And this is the person, the elite are saying they want to be the next prime minister. No, thanks. What do, what do you make of it all? Oh, well, words almost fail me, uh, but not quite. Good. Um, <laughs> I, I, I would say I would say it's it, it's instructive to see a clip like that. It's important to see what sort of leader, what sort of man Jeremy Hunt is, uh, you know, before he gets any closer to being uh, leader of the Conservative Party and possibly the Prime Minister. You know, you talk you know, people saying that he's a safe pair of hands. I mean, I would say the, the indication there is that he, he offers, you know, a tight pair of handcuffs. Uh, potentially for every man, woman and child in the country. Uh, the fantasy of zero COVID, of, of zero infection, is, is just that and only that. It's a fantasy. Uh, and I appreciate that he was saying that a couple of years ago, but, but to see that, to see those words, that point of view being cheerfully expressed out of a smiling face, when at the same time we're, we've been looking at images of you know people howling from their tower blocks in Shanghai, you know, trapped in their homes, starving, dying, you know, while their cats and dogs are beaten to death in the streets outside with sticks. You know, it's interesting to see a smiling Jeremy Hunt uh, making noises that, that he approves of that kind of draconian authoritarianism. And then the, the gleeful way that he was describing, uh, you know, his sister being escorted by, you know, armed guard practically to and from the airport and, and then saying that that was somehow appropriate, uh, an appropriate way to treat anyone. It, it's so interesting to see, to be to have them sorted out at this point, to see the people that harbour these fantasies of authoritarian, totalitarian rule. You know, we, we can see him. He's, he's made plain what sort of a person he is. And, you know, that's it's good to get that out into the open now. Absolutely. And I think history should judge these zero COVID zealots because, as you rightly point out, Neil, the hellscape of China at the moment proves why zero COVID is something that should never have been pursued. And obviously, that's what same folk were saying all over the world. No, well, yes, and, and look where look where something similar was attempted. Variations on that theme, uh, Australia. Mm. Uh, you, you know, I mean, I, I'm I'm reading that in Australia, in Victoria, people are being told that it's against the law for them to grow their own food. I, I mean, where is where is thinking? Where is a strategy like that going? New Zealand, which also under Jacinda Ardern pursued 
zero COVID. Uh, you know, ag again, just a, a fantasy. Um, uh, Justin Trudeau in Canada, he's on film uh, saying that there are aspects of the way China's uh, Communist Party runs things that he admires. Uh, you know, I've, I've even seen him on camera saying that, you know, he's, he quite wishes that, that he could act similarly in his own country. And those are the countries that have locked down and, and uh, penalised and persecuted their citizens in the most draconian ways. Canadians still can't travel about the country freely. They can't leave the country. Uh, he it was that you know that, that that took the money from the, the you know the, the GoFund uh, appeal that had raised the money for the for the truckers. It, it's so instructive to see that group of uh, first world politicians, those leaders, uh, who given an inch took a mile, uh, and 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 sought every possible extreme of power over their populations. And, and there we see in, in Jeremy Hunt, uh, you know, a little proto uh, totalitarian again. You know, fortunately, you know, he's no nearer to power than that at the moment. Yeah. Uh, and, and hopefully, people pay attention. People pay attention. Uh, I mean, he's he's marking himself out as an enemy of freedom, an enemy of free people. Uh, I tell you now, I didn't follow the rules last time. Uh, after the first couple of weeks of lockdown, when it was apparent to, to anyone with their eyes open that it was going to be ruinous to keep everyone shut down, to, to shut down the economy. You know, I set those rules aside for myself. And the, the next person that tries it, the next leader that tries it, be it Jeremy Hunt or anybody else, you know, I won't, I won't uh, uh, obey those rules for a moment because yeah, I think okay. it's, it's the responsibility of, of moral people to set yeah. aside immoral laws. And if anyone tries anything like lockdown again, far less the lockdown that's been attempted in China, no way. And, you know, if I ever encounter him in the street, I would I would put him straight on that point. You know, well, I'll, And I'll they'll look at the, the economic side. catastrophe that we're dealing with now. And yes. it was so predictable. Of course, of course, it was predictable. If you take a if you take a, a juggernaut of, a, of an economy the size of Britain's and you bring it to a halt, of course, there are going to be catastrophic economic consequences for that. Uh, and, and, and the fact that, that there's been this blatant attempt to make it look as though it's the fault of the war in Ukraine that's pushing up energy prices and all of the rest of it is the clumsiest sleight of hand. The economic ruination that, that, we're, that we're likely facing at the moment is a consequence of two years of lockdown. And, and to be perfectly honest with you, from a, a humanitarian point of view, the, the damage to the economy is only a part of it. The, the lockdown was also so unbelievably damaging, as yet immeasurably damaging to people's physical and mental well-being, the physical and mental well-being of children, you know, right down to the, the, the development of, of babies and toddlers. All of it's been compromised and we'll be dealing with the consequences of that ever after. And it's very instructive. Thank goodness somebody pressed record on, on Jeremy Hunt two years ago so that we can see that a, a would-be king of the Tories uh, presented with the same set of circumstances again, would shut us in our homes until, you know, uh, you know, until kingdom come. Indeed, Jeremy Hunt, a zero COVID zealot who must never lead the Tory party and here, here. certainly never the United Kingdom. Neil Oliver, thank you so much for exposing that. Thanks, Dan. It's 10 p.m. I'm Dan Wooten. Tonight, as Keir Starmer confirms he'll quit if he's fined over Beargate. If the police decide to issue me with a fixed penalty notice, I would, of course, do the right thing and step down. Is the Labour leader's vow nothing more than an attempt to reclaim the moral high ground? A big hour of Beargate analysis coming up. At 10.40, The Sun's political columnist Trevor Kavanagh is uncancelled and asking if the Starmer has lost all sense of right and wrong as a result of his lockdown hypocrisy. Tory grandee David Mallor will be here too at 10.20. And in just a moment, I'll look at how tomorrow's newspapers are covering Starmer's announcement. Intrigued to see, actually, what the lefty publications say, given how ruthless they were to Boris. Plus, as Lisa Nandy refuses to rule out a bid for the top job, who should take charge of Labour to give Britain the opposition leader it deserves? I'll break down the runners and riders next with my superstar panel, the Daily Express columnist Carol Malone, senior reporter at the I newspaper Benjamin Butterworth and Broad 
broadcaster Bev Turner. And speaking of Albev, as the establishment finally acknowledges concern over vaccine damage and side effects, were COVID hysterics wrong to demonise her for making comments just like this? Why are you? Why do you want to put a, a 22-year-old with her whole life ahead of her as part of a clinical trial when we do not know the long-term implications? We'll debate that clip from ITV's This Morning. That's going viral in the media buzz. Plus, I'll respond to the lovey gushing over Channel 4 at last night's BAFTAs and ask, what on earth is going on at the EU? As if today couldn't get more surreal. Good Lord, all of that at 10.30. And don't forget, I'll crown my first greatest Britain and Union jackass of the week at 10.50. But before all of that, the news with Tabs and Roberts. Dan, thank you. Good evening from the GB Newsroom. Prince Charles will deliver the speech at the state opening of Parliament tomorrow after it was confirmed the Queen will not attend. It'll be the first time the monarch has not been at the Westminster event in nearly 60 years. In a statement, Buckingham Palace says Her Majesty continues to experience episodic mobility problems and, after speaking with her doctors, has reluctantly decided to pull out. The Duke of Cambridge will also be attending in her place. Sir Keir Starmer has said he will step down as Labour leader if he's fined by police. It's after an investigation was launched into allegations he broke coronavirus rules at a curry and beer gathering in Durham in April last year. Labour's deputy leader, Angela Rayner, who was also at the event, has said she will also quit if fined, but insists no rules were broken. Sir Keir says he has always followed the rules. The first group of illegal migrants will be told this week of government plans to send them to Rwanda. The Home Secretary says those who cross the channel will be among those to be deported to the East African nation. Priti Patel says the government has the power to detain those individuals pending their removal from the UK. The first flights are expected to take off in the coming months. DUP leader Sir Geoffrey Donaldson says his party will not form an executive until the UK government takes action over the Northern Ireland Protocol. Just a warning now, there are some flashing images in this next footage. Sinn Féin's deputy leader Michelle O'Neill says it's Boris Johnson and the EU's responsibility to find solutions to the protocol, but that Northern Ireland will not be held to ransom. The would-be First Minister said the British government and the DUP must accept the result of the Assembly election. It's after Sinn Féin became Stormont's largest party, winning a historic 27 seats last Thursday. A car has crashed into the Prime Minister's house in South London. The black Vauxhall Astra drove into the front garden of the property in Camberwell in the early hours of this morning. The vehicle damaged hedges and a tree and knocked down a small pillar in the front of the house. TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now let's head straight back to Dan. Tomorrow's news tonight now in our media buzz. First look at the front page is hot off the press. Let's start with the Metro, which goes with the headline, Get a fine, we will resign. Labour leaders Keir Starmer and Angela Rayner are betting their political future on the outcome of the Durham Police investigation. And the Queen is to be represented at the opening of Parliament by Prince Charles after she had to pull out as issues with her mobility continue. The Independent also leading with Starmer's pledge to resign if he is handed a COVID fine by police, and we'll have more on that in a moment. My superstar panel return now, though. Columnist for the Daily Express, Carol Malone. Senior reporter at the I newspaper, Benjamin Butterworth, and the broadcaster, Bev Turner. Now, Keir Starmer could have brought a Labour leadership contest closer after he vowed to resign if Durham police fine him over the Beargate scandal. For me, this is an in-principle position um, no rules are broken. I'm absolutely clear about that. But in the event that I'm wrong about that and I get a fixed penalty notice... 
His deputy, Angela Rayner, then appeared to follow suit by saying, I've always been clear that I was at the event in Durham. Uh, no, you <laughs> haven't, love. Working in my capacity as deputy leader and that no rules were broken. Eaten during a, eating during a long day's work was not against the rules. We have a prime minister who has been found to have broken the rules, lied about it and then been fined. If I were issued with a fine, I would do the decent thing and step down. She wouldn't know the truth. Smacked her in the face, would she? So, with a sensational showdown potentially on the cards, the lefty vultures are already beginning to circle. Shadow levelling up Secretary Lisa Nandy ran against Starmer in the 2020 leadership election. Speaking to Sly News yesterday, refused to rule out her own bid for the top job. Do you fancy have another crack at the leadership? Look, I stood to be leader of the Labour Party because I believe that our nations and regions across Britain had been fundamentally underserved for decades and we needed to turn that around. We need to get good jobs back into towns like Wigan and across the country and we need to start putting money in people's pockets and rebuilding our communities. That's the job that Keir Starmer has handed me. We've got to be in government, get rid of this tired, desperate government and start to turn around the fortunes of the people in this country. That sounded a little bit like another leadership pitch to me. She wants your job, Starmer. She's not even trying to hide it. So, with Nandy brazenly indicating her ambitions, let's take a look at some of the runners and riders of Starmer Does Go. The bookmakers have Greater Manchester Mayor Andy Burnham as the current frontrunner, followed by Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streety. Others in contention are Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves and Nandy, who we just heard from. And can we really rule out Rainer from wriggling her way back into contention? Wow, is that really what the best Labour has to offer, Beth? I mean, seriously. It's, it's, they're not good, are they, really? No. I have to, I, we have to kind of cast our minds back. I was thinking when, when Jeremy Corbyn was made leader of the Labour Party, it was 2015. Doesn't that, yeah. It doesn't feel like seven years ago, does it? That's, for me, that's a way. I mean, time's oh, kind of gone elastic with COVID and everything, you know. But um, So what's happened from that point? They, when, he, when he beat Andy Burnham in that leadership mm. election... Andy Burnham very cleverly went up north. Yeah. He was like, you know what, the Labour Party is not going to be anything in Westminster for, for a, long a time. very long time. I'm going to go up north, I'm going to keep my nose clean, I'm going to keep out of this chaos, and then I will come back when the time is right. What will be so interesting is to see if he does think the time is now right. With an election probably next year, I don't know whether this is going to be the right time for Andy Burnham. I mean, I don't think he'll take this on right now. I, I, I mean, an, Andy Burnham always thinks it's the time for he Andy does, Burnham yeah, to be does. leader because he's run and lost quite badly on two occasions. I like Andy Burnham. I think a lot of people like and yeah, respect him. Yeah, me too. Him. Doesn't but, sound like but it. He's, but he's not going to... to hear how you speak about <laughs> your friend. <laughs> but he, he's not, never going to be Prime Minister. You know, I feel a bit sorry for, for Lisa and Andy there because her or any other politician, of course, people who are that far down the line want to be leader, want to be prime minister, but they can't say that. So I kind of think, you know, it's an unfortunate question for any of them because, mm -hmm. because they have their hands tied and there's nothing wrong with wanting to, to lead your country. But personally, I would go with Wes Streeting. And it's extraordinary, actually, because he's the Shadow Health Secretary you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Now, he's the second favourite for the bookies. He was only made in the shadow cabinet, put in the shadow cabinet in November, but he's had such a big impact. He's done this channel many times. And, you know, I voted for Lisa Nandy, not for Keir Starmer as a Labour Party member last time. I think we're streeting has the most charisma. No am I, am I, am I, am I sensing a little crush, Benjamin? No, I've known Wes no. since I was a teenager. Yeah, but most know? people have got no idea who he is. Most people have got That's no true. idea That's who he is. That's absolutely correct. But I, is. but I think a bit like, dare I mention her name, uh, Jacinda Ardern, who came out of nowhere to be a hugely and then, successful... And then ruined at, at New the Zealand. <laughs> yeah. That's certainly not someone you should be trying to follow. Carol. Do you know, when we were talking about this, uh, this afternoon, I think the question was going to be, you know, what, who... Who does Labour deserve? And yeah. I think Labour deserves as the leader David Lammy, and then they'll never get elected ever. <laughs> um, that, that, but, I, but I had to look up the shadow cabinet, right? Because I, and it's just a bunch of no marks, yeah. okay? Yvette Cooper, David Lammy, Steve Reid. I mean, uh, Ed, do you know it's Ed Miliband? Who, who, I don't even know who Nick Thomas Simons is, Jonathan Ashworth. Mm. They're all no marks. No one knows yeah. who they are. No one cares who they are. And you know the stupid thing in all of this. You've forgotten Emily Thornbury. Uh, Emily, Th yeah, Emily Thornbury. <laughs> and 
you know, and, I mean, Yvette Cooper and Rachel Reeves, those two, the very idea, those two, a couple of weeks ago, couldn't say what a woman was. No, she, so, no Rachel Reeves yeah. was stumbling all over herself, wasn't no, she? But, but neither of her nor Yvette Cooper could say what a woman was, which I just thought... Or Annalise think, Dodds, you know, who you haven't mentioned. Not, but she's yeah. not... But, but, you know, in a, what, at this point, what I really want to say is, of everyone, I still think here... Is Summer's the better one to lead? For even for everything he's done, and I despise what he's done. I still think that of everyone in the Labour Party, he is the would be the better leader. Yeah, but he's put that in someone else's hands now, though, hasn't he? Well, he well, no, he hasn't because he knew. I mean, how can we? we he knows he's going to get. We clear. can't preempt what Durham Police are. But he's not going to get a fixed penalty. But we've talked purpose. about this, and Durham Police massive pressure. I doubt very much whether he will be um, mm. given the fixed penalty. You know, I mean, I know the Labour Party pretty well. Uh, and I would bet money, I'd bet, you know, 20 quid to a food bank. Oh, we that's a lot. If we come back in a few years, two years, the next Labour leadership election will be Angela Rayner versus Wes Streeting. I'm absolutely certain of it. If I, Angela Rayner will make Labour unelectable in the same way Corbyn did, Angela Rayner will do the same. Mm. People don't like her. I, all this stuff about her being northern working class Red Wall is tosh. People in the Red Wall do not like Angela Rayner. The quote of her flashing her ginger growl as she can never get away from that. <laughs> I'm glad you said that. I'm she can never get away that, from that. that. That is going to follow her around everywhere. everywhere. But she said worse than that, the Tory scum stuff. You know, you can... You can take a politician down with facts and with, you know, with something that they've done, but you can't just abuse. It doesn't work. Mm. Have you known Angela Rayner since you were a teenager, Benjamin? No, too? but I... Uh, Still is, isn't he? But, you know, Angela Rayner, if you look at her constituency, the vote has gone down yeah. every six subsequent election really? that she's stood. She's too lefty oh, for you. And you just want Wes Streeting because he's Tony Blair Mark II, don't you? I, I do think he is the nearest to Tony Blair that the Labour Party has had because he has guts and he has charisma. And he still supports New Labour, which yeah, very few I. people I in that current viewers, shadow cabinet I know some of your viewers think I'm a communist, but, uh, you know, I was in the room when Jeremy Corbyn was elected Labour leader in 2015 mm. and I refused to stand up for him when everyone applauded. I refused to ever clap that man. I've never even followed him on Twitter well, because he... Is but you didn't quit the party, did want. you? No, because I wanted With to an use my vote. With an anti I wanted to use my vote to change the party, and you know that's that was far more useful than me simply. But, the, but isn't it weird that there was the Corbynites, the far left Corbynites, and on the right, there's just nothing now. To me, it's just all they're all cotton wool. None of them have made a mark. I, I West Streeting maybe, but you know Rishi Sunak came from nowhere. Look what's happened to him over the past couple. Yeah, of Yeah, but West Streeting's from a council flat with a single mum in Tower Hamlets. Oh, so not from what? billionaires. Well, no, but Rishi Sunak is not from billionaires. His Parents were not billionaires. They had a business. They're only worth about they, 100 billion. They made, yes, now they are because they made it work. They came from nothing, his parents. You're talking tosh. I think yeah. it's too soon for Lisa <laughs> and Andy, though. <laughs> I do know a few people who are Labour voters and Labour supporters who really like Lisa and Andy. For whatever reason, I, she they do find like her, her a very safe pair of hands. They find her fairly straightforward. But she's not a killer. She's not a no. She's, she's not, a not very dynamic, I, is she? I, I think she's very committed. Of yeah. all of them, I think she's the most decent. But I just don't think she's a leader in that sense. But then look at we've got you know we've got, we've had leaders who who are supposed to be there because of their dynamism. I quite, it's quite refreshing to think we might have somebody who's got some decency. Even well, if they're not Starmer. the best. <laughs> yeah. no, well, no. He's proven <laughs> today, Benjamin Butterworth, there. that he's a bloke with absolutely no decency. Speaking of people with no decency, uh, Prince Harry. Uh, <laughs> oh, he God. sure loves gassing himself <laughs> up, doesn't he? The Duke of Sussex has made a big splash in my home country of New Zealand with his new project, Travelist which allows holidaymakers down under to access an online rating for how sustainable they've been on their travels. Now, in a truly bizarre five-minute clip posted on YouTube today, Harry follows in the footsteps of his thespian bride, Meghan Markle, and gives a similarly wooden performance while wearing a cringy <laughs> girl dad T-shirt in a bid, I think, to prove his feminist credentials. Look. According to my notes here, you were given 12 towels at Tim's Motor Lodge and you only used one for the entire stay, so pretty good. I don't think I stayed there. And 12 towels, that's pretty excessive, I mean... 12 towels is excessive. Mm. Oh, you were very respectful of local communities. In fact, you even bought some local honey. Yes, I remember that. Was that nice? Uh, yes. Good. And you did not keep the tap running whilst brushing your teeth? No, I never do. Hang on a second. How did you know that? How do you know that? That's really weird. 
Yeah, more eco hypocrisy from private jet lover Hazza there. As friend of the show Jamie Jenkins, aka Stats Jamie, pointed out, a round trip from LA to London, the kind the Sussexes will be getting for the Platinum Jubilee next month, pumps out nine times the average CO2 a Brit uses in a year. You don't need an app to point out the floor in Harry's great green scheme there. But Bev, turn it, you, you've got concerns about this oh, travellers project. I watched that five minutes video today, just aghast, because he's, it's like he's teeing up the Chinese social credit system, because it's not about just, um, it's not like TripAdvisor when you're giving the place you're visiting a rating. This is the people at the venue giving you a rating on your behaviour and on your green credentials and how you behave in that country. I don't want any part of a system like that. I don't want to be judged by an app. I don't want the person... I'm not even very keen on an Uber driver giving me stars. I mean, it's the extension of that. I, I think it's bizarre. I mean, but this, like, this to me, doing. Carol, feels to me like rich people who are very privileged and want to make really? themselves feel better for travelling yeah. all around the globe. Yeah, but, but he's, him and her have been like that since day one, the pair of them. You know, they have preached... They've told us to do one thing and they do entirely the opposite. And, and can I just say really quickly, I do not want the pair of them in this country for the Queen's Jubilee because, we, you know, well, whatever happens, whatever gets said to the pair of them, they're going to... They're going to repeat it to Netflix and probably... Would you boo them? I, I would boo them and I would ban them, actually. I don't know, I don't know why the Queen has allowed them to come. They, it's going to cause absolute... Because they have a lot of ground to make up with Netflix, as do, we do, know. do you want to defend these two? Well, do you know, I, I agree with lots of their worldview and their politics. Oh, but, but ultimately, I just don't... I think cashing in on your royal titles to the extent That's they right. have is... It's vulgar. Because, it's because completely he, said, vulgar. he said being in the royal family is like living in the Truman Show. Well, I can see what he means. Yeah. Well, then, you've now got 30 Netflix cameras following Stop you. Stop encouraging yeah. So you've exactly. just repeated yes. it for profit. Completely. By the way, I really want to show you this. Uh, the Prime Minister may have just made a shock appearance on the Netflix smash Bridgerton. So an eagle eye viewer has gone viral for sharing this scene of the series lead character Kate Sharma, who can be seen staring up at a viewer, <laughs> which has a Boris Johnson <laughs> doppelganger tucked away in the corner. Did they do that on purpose? It really does look like him. Bev Turner, Benjamin Butterworth, Carol Malone, <laughs> do stand by because coming up, have the establishment finally started taking vaccine damage seriously? And is our very own panellist Bev Turner finally vindicated for what she said on ITV's This Morning last year. We'll debate that in the media buzz. But next, will Beargate be Starmer's downfall or is it just a hollow ploy to take the moral high ground? Tory Grandy, David Maller breaks down the story of the day straight after the break. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6 on GB News. Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wilson. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship 
and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wharton tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. And we're back. More newspaper front pages coming up. Uh, but for nearly six months, the red side of Westminster incessantly droned on, calling for Boris Johnson's resignation, even when he was yet to be fined. But now Keir Starmer's Cormac Karma is finally catching up with him. They lied about who was there. They lied about whether it was planned. They lied about going back to work. And they lied about all other restaurants being closed. The cover-up over what went on that night in Durham would make Richard Nixon proud. And as I wrote in a column for the Mail Online tonight, not only did Labour nod through every liberty sapping restriction without demanding any evidence the policies would work, Starmer would almost always insist publicly that Boris Johnson needed to go faster, longer, harder. But just like the party goers at number 10, Starmer was never scared. His COVID hysteria was nothing more than performance art designed for political gain. When the cameras were off, the masks were ditched, uh, the rules were ignored, social distancing went out the window, curries were consumed and bottles of beers were downed. Here's what the big bore with an even bigger quiff had to say at his so-called press conference earlier today. Ever since the first COVID lockdown, I've always followed the rules. In that time, the British people have made heart-wrenching sacrifices. People were left desperately lonely. They were separated from family and friends. Tragically, many were unable to see dying loved ones. This was a collective sacrifice. People were entitled to expect that politicians would follow the same rules as everyone else. Crying crocodile tears about the tragedy of lockdowns doesn't work when it was your job to curtail the government's draconian policies and rein them in. Another failure that Mr Starmer should have long ago resigned for. But joining me now to continue my beer gate analysis is Tory party grandee David Maller. So, David, should Starmer have followed his own lead and resigned upon being investigated by police? Because, of course, that's what he said Boris Johnson yeah. should have done. Yeah. It's such a shame that Starmer has gone in so big on all that went on at Partygate, because now he, you know, it's not an original phrase, unfortunately, it's being used all over the papers, but it's worth repeating, he's been hoist with his own petard, and now I think he is the victim of circumstance over which he has no control. What he's had to say is that if he is fined for what he did, he will, he will resign. And, you know, and if he resigns, the, the, the woman they said wasn't there, Angela <laughs> Rayner, she might have to go too. It's, uh, I mean, it's slightly in you couldn't make it up territory. And I, you're laughing, Dan, I'm laughing, because it's an irony, isn't it? Well, it's farcical. It? These people, it's when, farcical. When, when they stand there pointing the finger, they don't realise someone's pointing the finger in a more sensitive part of their anatomy, you know? But, David, that's what's so shocking. When he was calling on Rishi Sunak, right, to resign because he was simply in a room where a cake was presented to the Prime Minister, I mean, Sunak doesn't even drink, he's teetotal, and he wanted him to resign for that as Chancellor, he knew that he'd had this boozy curry night and that he'd been filmed. I mean, is the bloke stupid or did he just think that the media would never come for him? Well, there's a case for saying that it's stupid, or rather it's reckless. I mean, think about Keir Starmer, you know, I was a lawyer who went into politics. I always thought I was really a politician who just earned a living as a lawyer. Starmer was a much more successful lawyer than me because, of course, he was around a lot longer. He was director of public prosecutions. And I've always thought one of Starmer's problems is that he's more of a lawyer than he is a politician. Mm. But how could he, as a proper lawyer, not realise how he was actually holding out his wrists and inviting someone to handcuff him? And do you share the feelings of some other uh, in the legal profession, David, who say that Starmer is putting undue pressure now on the Durham police, you know, a relatively small police force, who now know that they hold the future of the opposition leader mm. in the hands of actually what should be a minor investigation. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. You don't really need me, Dan. <laughs> You've got all, the, uh, got all the answers. I mean, you're absolutely right. The police are under enormous uh, pressures, uh, but at the end of the day, so were the police dealing with uh, 
you know, drinking sessions at number 10. And they sent out, rightly or wrongly, lots of penalty notices, possibly rightly for Boris, probably wrongly for Rishi Sunak, who just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, but, you know, at the end of it all, it's not exactly, I mean, you know, it's not something you need Sherlock Holmes for this one. Dr. Watson could probably got it right, or indeed Dr. Watson's pussycat if he had one. <laughs> because the reality of this is that uh, Starmer is caught bang to rights. And every time they've tried to explain it, they've lied. I mean, this was not just, oh, gosh, what a hard day we've had. Uh, can't get anything to eat. Oh, let's send out for a curry. I mean, they, they, it was booked in that they were going to do that. Now, it's ludicrous, of course, that people at the end of a hard day can't sit together and have a meal, but those were the rules. And Starmer went along with those rules. Personally, I think a lot of this lockdown stuff was crazy, but that's a subject for another night. But while the rules were what they were, only a fool is going so blatantly... Uh, uh, to ride a coach and horses through them, whilst complaining that other people have done something similar, because it just invites exactly what's happening to him now. And his leadership hangs by a thread tonight. From a Tory point of view, David, do you actually think that it could be better for Boris Johnson if Starmer remains in post, limping on damaged? <laughs> Yes, you, you, you look at both of them and you feel Starmer needs Boris because, uh, you know, Starmer will always look like Mr. Integrity when uh, Boris um, um, lurches into view. But equally, um, Bo but Boris needs Starmer because Starmer is just so kind of unimaginative and plodding. I mean, he really has no flair for what he's being asked to do. But one dreads to think what will happen, you know. I mean, if Boris goes and Sunak is as wounded as he is, who are we going to end up with in that situation? Well, by the same token, if Starmer goes, particularly if his deputy has to follow him, where do they then go? And in particular, we have to remember, Labour have got a problem that the Tories don't have. The Tories are not exactly a united party, but they are not really fundamentally divided in the way that Labour are. Labour are so fundamentally divided that Starmer, to be fair to him, has quite bravely taken on the Corbynistas and so on. Will that continue under a new leader? Hmm. Uh, you know, the old Chinese curse May you live in interesting times is very relevant here because Starmer is going to live in very interesting times. But alas, so are the rest of us. Fascinating analysis from the barrister broadcaster, of course, former Tory minister, David Mallet, QC. Thank you so much, David. But coming up, has Starmer lost all sense of right and wrong with his lockdown hypocrisy? The Sun's political columnist Trevor Kavanagh with me shortly on that. But next, were COVID hysterics wrong to demonise Bev Turner and others who expressed concern about vaccine damages? My superstar panel are on the way to debate this very controversial topic next. You're not going to want to miss this. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates and strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, six till seven on Jubes and Kerr. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's Brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News.
Hello, I'm Patrick Christie's. And I'm Mercy Moroki. Make sure that you join us Monday to Thursday, 10 a.m. until midday, right here on GB News for To The Point. We're not afraid to talk about the topics that matter to you or the big topics that always matter. We cover absolutely everything, from the breaking political stories of the day to law and order, what's going on in the channel. We're not afraid to hold people to account. We always make sure we include your views on our show. Indeed, if you're thinking it, you can guarantee that we're saying it. So make sure you join the conversation with us. 10 a.m. until midday, Monday to Thursday, for To The Point on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back to the show, especially to all of our brilliant listeners tuning in on GB News Radio on DAB+. It's time now to return to tomorrow's news tonight in our media bus. And more front pages have just been delivered. The Queen to miss state opening of Parliament leads the Daily Telegraph. Uh, Her Majesty's episodic mobility problems continue, according to Buckingham Palace. Plus, Britain could be offered a closer relationship with Brussels as part of a new EU-dominated organisation. French President Emmanuel Macron is advocating for a new European political community which will allow countries like the UK and Ukraine the chance to choose their level of integration. Uh, with Brussels. No thanks, Macron. The Sun also leading with the sad news that the Queen will miss the state opening of Parliament for the first time in 59 years, with Prince Charles making the televised speech in a historic change to protocol. The Daily Mail, good on them. It leads with Sir Keir Starmer being accused of piling pressure on Durham police over Beargate after confirming he would step down if given a fine. The Times continue the trend and are also leading with Starmer's promise to quit if fined. The paper quotes a report by The Guardian that claims Labour have compiled time-stamped logs of WhatsApp chats, documents and video edits to prove Bears with Care was a work event. But, according to a Politico source, some party staff present were drunk and so, quote, obviously weren't working. The Daily Star goes intergalactic with a former NASA scientist saying we will have a close encounter with alien life in just a few years, adding, because the world hasn't got enough problems right now. More on the media buzz with tonight's superstar panel columnist for the Daily Express, Carol Malone, senior reporter at the I newspaper, Benjamin Butterworth, and broadcaster, Bev Turner. Now, the shocking indifference with which the establishment has treated sufferers of COVID vaccine side effects has been laid bare with the revelation that zero compensation has been paid. Zero compensation for more than 1,200 claims to the vaccine damages payment scheme. We have started to hear the right noises, albeit quiet little whimpers at this stage, from the people in power who have previously wanted to ignore this issue completely. This clip of Jeremy Hunt, chair of the Health and Social Care Select Committee, has gone viral in recent days because of the former Health Secretary's acknowledgement of the extent of the vaccine damages problem. I just wondered what your thoughts were with regarding to uh, an investigation on the serious adverse reactions that we're currently seeing. Thank you. Debbie's question, I, I want to take that away um, because I... Um, I think it's something that my committee might be interested in looking at. I'll need to talk to my other members of my committee because we decide these things democratically. But I, um, when I was health secretary, I commissioned the University of Sheffield, Leeds and Manchester to do a report on to medication error. Um, and, you know, we found there were 8,000 deaths a year. And, um, you know, obviously we are very concerned about the uh, adverse reactions that we have from the COVID vaccines. Um, it's not for me to make a judgment as to the balance of risk, um, but I think we do need to fully understand the issues that you raise. However, former NHS nurse Debbie Evans, who bravely challenged Hunt in a patient care webinar, has since revealed concerns about his dedication to the issue. She was told by Hunt last week, more than a month after she sent a follow-up email, that she had not yet raised the prospect of a probe with the committee. Here's what she had to say. He said on camera... 
And he said in that email that these COVID-19 vaccine serious adverse reactions are of a serious concern. And yet they're not serious enough to put on the agenda of the Health and Social Care Committee or on his own patient watch committee that he founded. The concerns are there. These numbers are escalating every single day. Um, but he clearly doesn't want to answer the question. And that makes me even more suspicious. Hunt reiterated that he appreciated concerns of adverse vaccine reactions and said he would bring up the subject at a future meeting. So clearly this fight is not over yet. And I suppose it's no surprise the government's uh, passivity after the likes of our own Bev Turner were villainised and even labelled neo-Nazis for expressing concerns about vaccine side effects for the past two years. So... Take a look back at her comments on ITV's This Morning in May last year, which actually resulted in 52 Ofcom complaints being made against her. This clip has gone viral this week because, let's just say, the comments don't sound so outrageous now. It's a trial drug. Oh. We are still in clinical trials, Matthew. And Why are you saying... You just have to look at the numbers. Just in the, in the sense of, like, the finest minds of science of... In, in an extraordinarily in short amount of time have come up with this vaccine. It's proven that it's working statistically. Why are you so cynical about We data? have no long-term data. Why are you so sceptical about the whole thing? 99.8% because, because of the facts. 99.8% survival rate from COVID-19. The average age of death is 82. Why, are you, why do you want to put a 22-year-old with her whole life ahead of her as part of a clinical trial when we do not know the long-term implications? Bev Turner, it's fascinating looking back at this clip now. Do you feel a sense of vindication? Do I feel a sense of vindication? When that debate was actually happening, what you don't see there, that was particularly about the NHS mandates. It was the first time that that had been raised as a consideration whether doctors should be mandated to take a trial drug. It was the first debate I'd had about that. And so I was very clearly trying to make the point, I was clearly trying to make the point, that um, everybody should be an individual risk benefit profile as to whether they take the drug or not. And it was really obvious very early on, not because of I was digging out obscure data, although I was spending a lot of time doing that, but because Patrick Balance and Chris Whitty had said very clearly in those ridiculous press conferences, mm. this will not stop you catching or passing on COVID-19. This is to mitigate your symptoms. But of course, mitigating symptoms, therefore being less transmissible, made a lie of the concept of asymptomatic transmission. So that's what that debate was about. Do I feel vindicated now? Well, yeah, obvi obviously. I mean, I didn't, I didn't change the conversation. Dr Steve James changed that particular conversation when he took on Sajid Javid at King's Hospital. But I, I, I like to think in some way I was, I was just trying to... I was shouting into the abyss at that particular time mm. because nobody was listening. Because, because mandates were predicated on the notion of this drug stopping transmission, take that away, clarify the mm. science behind that, and it made a mockery of the fact that you have to take a drug because the state tells you you have to, and that is... That, that was it. And so that, that conversation was very frustrating to me because it just wasn't built on any sort of science. But Benjamin, as a journalist, why have you not been looking into the vaccine damage? I mean, I'm not a health and science journalist and I think they do much better jobs uh, because they have a lot of context. And one of the things is, you know, of course, it, clearly it's right to say that we don't have long-term data, but we also knew that it was highly effective and, you know, a year and a half or whatever it is into the rollout of the COVID vaccine, there have been some people with side effects, but a very, very small amount. You know, one of the questions that was raised was the problem of blood clots. But we now have the data that says you're 10 times more likely to get a blood clot from COVID than from a COVID vaccine. And so that's why but you that shouldn't doesn't focus mean, on those... But, but Carol, that doesn't mean that the people who have suffered these side effects shouldn't be compensated. I mean, I've got someone on the show tomorrow night on Uncancelled who has had to have his leg amputated because of a side effect from the AstraZeneca vaccine. Are you seriously telling me he shouldn't be compensated and that I'm, shouldn't be I'm a big very, story? I'm very sorry about that, uh, that he's having his leg vaccinated, but I just... Amputated. I want... I'm, it's been I'm, amputated. But I, uh, I'm very sorry that's happened to him. Um, but, you know, I want to take issue with what Bev said about it being a trial drug. It wasn't a trial drug. It's still a trial drug. No, it's like, not it, a trial <laughs> drug. Do you you realise that every vaccine that is produced 
is in effect a trial drug. Uh, no, 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 no. This no, is, no this is, let me, I can't let, believe no, no. we're still having this no, conversation. No, well, like, well, oh, maybe for you, the love you of had God. a long say there, so let everyone else have a say. The smallpox vaccine, when it came out in the 50s, caused myocardia in young men. The polio vaccine, when it came out, it, people died because of the polio virus. In 2008, which isn't that long ago, uh, babies developed febrile seizures because of the MMR vaccine after seven to ten days. There's a mis there's the, you know, we know that vaccines aren't a cure-all for everyone, but, but the bottom line is the COVID vaccine, and this is a guy, he was, he's a guy called Paul Goford, a very, he's the director of vaccine research at the University of Alabama. He says he's never, ever seen a vaccine as effective as COVID. Okay, 90 so my first question would be, who is funding let that me guy? Finish, because Bev, almost let nobody... Me, Bev, you know, this is what happens. People who disagree with people who, who like you, don't agree with the vaccine. The, you, no one, no one is ever allowed to speak. So, so, oh, believe what this, me, what people this, were allowed this, to speak what this, Well, I'm, I'm trying now. The, the guy, this guy said 90% decreased risk of infections, 94% effectiveness against hospitalisation. So whatever you say about well, I, this okay. being a trial drug, it saved lives. And what? you can't get away from that fact. And if people have been damaged by this, I'm very sorry, I really am. And I don't say that glibly or lightly. But the thing is, this vaccine saved many millions of lives. And we know that for a fact. We don't know that for a fact. Yes, we do. I'm so yes, sorry, we do. but we don't know that for a fact. OK, well, let me tell you, let me and, tell you what and... happened to the people who didn't get the vaccine, the elderly in the care homes. In the first two months of the pandemic, in the first two months of the pandemic, 35,000 elderly people died. In one week, 7,000 elderly people died. They didn't have the vaccine. Later, as, as it progressed and they got the vaccine, those numbers but were if not you're dying. you're not saying homes. the vulnerable should not be vaccinated, are you? This is a very... What we saw in the last two years was people like Carol, who I have a huge amount of respect for, but on this particular... Well, you haven't, because you're saying people like Carol, people who thought the vaccine worked and it has worked. People like Carol, who were on those panel shows alongside me, were reading the Daily Mail and they were reading the mainstream oh, media. And in me order... or anybody to else to saying we just this, read one It was paper. absolutely necessary to go and look and find the epidemiologists... And you really think we didn't do that? Didn't, Seriously? Who, uh, yeah, it's so it's, insulting to, to say that a journalist only reads the Daily Mail. I have read... Umpteen so papers. what do you think of the latest findings of Dr Ryan Cole? What do you think of what Dr Robert Malone has said? What do you, what do well, you I know think? exactly what I think of what Dr Maloney said. He's been on this show and I've said what I think about the guy. Don't try and catch me out about the no, virologists that, I've, that I've read. Reece I've read the as much as These you, if not... people aren't going to be on the mainstream media. They just aren't. And I was, I was vilified for, for trying to And Malone to make... has been discredited in many quarters, let me tell you. Oh. Yes, he has. Please. Yes, you he has. That, uh, I, final word, COVID, Benjamin. Do you accept that the COVID vaccine worked? Have you had it yourself? I think in terms of does it work, we are still... We still have no long-term data. And if well, you look at the great latest interview that's, that's with Gert really. van den Bosch today, but, talking about the fact that indiscriminate point. vaccination different. during a pandemic will cause the mutations... Have you had it? It is still a moving... It is still a Have moving, you had the vaccine? And again, oh, my God, well, have I you? Arrive in, literally arrive in a time machine today. Have, have you? we not moved on? We're all stupid and you know better. Not a, and you're not a virologist, but you know better. I also very much, and I've maintained this, Did my values and my standards Did on you refuse this the issue, vaccine? No. Which is that well, I will never you won't say. publicly answer that question. There have been it's people who... who, who say. There are people who say... It, it's so irrelevant, Carol. It's just ridiculous. It's not irrelevant. OK. I believe the in the is, principle still be of lockdown medical... If everyone had taken that okay. view. Now, exactly. and let's be move on, uh, although I could talk about this all day, but I've got to tell you about the TV lovies who have succeeded in ruining yet another award ceremony with Vogue virtue signalling galore at last night's BAFTA. So in the wake of Culture Secretary Nadine Dorries vowing to deliver the media revolution Britain has been crying out for with the privatisation of lefty broadcaster Channel 4, champagne quaffing winners at the awards bash lined up to lambast the decision. Bucklebox might have ended when it started nine years ago because it got quite a modest audience. But a publicly owned, risk-taking Channel 4 believed in it. If the government goes ahead with its destructive plan to end Channel 4 as a, private, as a public organisation, those kind of risks won't be taken and a big part of what makes British television good will have ended for no good reason. Please, whatever we could do, 
the BBC and Channel 4 are things that we have to hold tight and fight for inch, 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 every inch. Thank you. Public service television is one of the foundations of distinctiveness and independence of thought in this country. Mark Rylance stood on this very stage six years ago and said, we're a nation of storytellers. We're admired around the world for it. And woe to any government or corporation who gets in the way of that. His words carry more weight now than ever. Odd that there was no plurality of thought broadcast on the BBC <laughs> last night, though. Now, if there was ever any doubt in anyone's mind why Brexit was the best decision for Britain, this next clip is the perfect example. Redresse-toi, fais quelques pas. Tu es face à un rideau de lierre. Avec une main, écarte le rideau. Traverse un long couloir. To mark the end of the conference for the future of Europe in Strasbourg, EU lawmakers decided to put on a toe curling interpretive dance performance. Thank God we're out of this nightmare of a parliament. Carol Malone. Bev Turner, Benjamin Butterworth, do stand by because coming up, it's the crowning moment of the show as I decide today's greatest Britain and union jackass. Cannot wait for that. We'll have some good nominees. But next, has Starmer lost all sense of right and wrong as a result of his lockdown hypocrisy? The Sun's respected political columnist Trevor Covenor breaks down Beargate next in Uncancelled. First, though, very quick look at what's coming up tomorrow. Coming up on Dan Woodson tonight, is Keir Starmer done for as leader of the opposition? I'll have more expert analysis on the Labour crisis. Is the Madeleine McCann case finally about to be solved after 15 years? Or have authorities got the wrong man? Detective turned investigative journalist Mark Williams Thomas revealed his findings from a private investigation into prime suspect Christian B. Will Harry and Meghan and their Netflix cameras send the Jubilee into chaos? Royal author Robert Jobson weighs in. Plus, I'll be joined by my superstar panel, former Daily Star editor and current columnist Dawn Neeson, Sunday Mirror political editor Nigel Nelson, and political YouTuber Maya Tusi. That's Dan Wharton tonight, Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. But it's time now for Uncancelled where Britain's top commentators speak out on controversial issues without the fear of the cancel culture sweeping the rest of the media. Now, as I said in my digest at the top of the show tonight, the Labour Party's tissue of lies over beers with care has finally collapsed and the leader of no opposition has been exposed as a dishonourable hypocrite. Only when backed into a corner by his own double standards did he try and claim back the moral high ground today by saying he would resign if he gets fined by Durham Police, knowing full well they don't hand out retrospective fixed penalty notices for lockdown breaches. When my mother-in-law passed away suddenly just before the lockdown, my wife and I were unable to provide her father with the support we wanted to afterwards because we followed the rules. The idea that I would then casually break those rules is wrong. And frankly, I don't believe those accusing me believe it themselves. They are just trying to feed cynicism, to get the public to believe all politicians are the same. I'm here to say that they're not. Well, my next guest thinks despite his lofty status as Queen's Counsel and ex-director of public prosecution, Starmer has a history of finding himself on the wrong side of the argument. The highly respected political columnist and associate editor at The Sun, Trevor Kavanagh, says the Labour leader has never seemed comfortable in this modern era of quick-thinking, media-savvy politics, but it is only in recent days that his flawed character has been so damagingly exposed. And, Trevor, I found this column absolutely fascinating because it feels like you believe this saga has actually exposed to the wider world the real Keir Starmer, who you've known for some time. Yes, I'd hate to have uh, Keir Starmer representing me in court after that performance. I think that it was just a typical loyalty stance where he's denying furiously everything that the general public right now believes is true. And I think that he's digging himself deeper into this uh, almost certain grave, his political grave, 
by denying the fact that he actually broke the rules that he insisted on not only uh, introducing when the government uh, wanted to introduce them, but wanted them to be even stronger. I think that he is exposed as a hypocrite with double standards, which apply uh, to Boris, but not to him, to Rishi Sunak, who is really about as innocent as you can be in all of this, but still not to him. He demands their resignation simply because the police are looking into their uh, case, but refuses to resign because the police in Durham are now looking into his case. And I think the idea that he will only resign if he's fined doesn't cut the mustard at all. I think that he uh, has made a big mistake by trying to play Holy Joe, holier than thou, and claiming that everybody else is in the wrong but him. And Trevor, as you point out in your column today, this isn't the first time that Starmer's character has been questioned. Uh, you say, actually, the evidence is everywhere to be seen because, as state prosecutor, Starmer tried to put innocent journalists behind bars for writing true stories but didn't fa prosecute Jimmy Savile. And then you say, as a leading shadow cabinet minister, he campaigned for Jeremy Corbyn to become our first anti-Semitic Marxist prime minister. He, of course, also, Trevor, wanted to overturn the biggest democratic mandate in British history, too. So there are lots of question marks around the character of uh, Keir Starmer, despite the fact that he put, tries to put himself on a pedestal morally. Absolutely. And I think that catalogue of previous convictions, as far as I'm concerned, that's what they are, uh, show these double standards of a man who simply does not know the difference between right and wrong. This is a man who, after all, was the state prosecutor. He was a cute Queen's counsel, or still is, and should know the law of the land. He must have known, surely, that uh, his party was denying that uh, Angela Rayner was sitting about two or three feet away from him while he was sipping his bottle of beer. And they denied it twice, having been asked twice. So this is not just um, hypocrisy, it is outright deceit. And it seems amazing that he can stand there today and claim that he's innocent. I mean, it's impossible to be innocent when you've got witnesses saying that the meal was ordered weeks in advance or planned weeks in advance and was due to finish at 10 with no other work involved. There is no way that this can be portrayed as a simple matter of working through the evening. It's not the case and it won't wash. Does it feel like a cover-up to you, like Trevor? I beg your pardon, you're, you're, the sound is terrible from your end. But so sorry, so sorry. Uh, final question then, Trevor, but I just asked, does it feel like a cover-up to you? Well, corruption is a strong word, uh, but uh, I do think that uh, the public has made up its mind about Keir Starmer. And in fact, not just the general public, but the party itself. You, it won't take much to remember that it was only six or eight months ago at the party conference, uh, that the Labour Party conference, that there were people actually saying at that time that he wasn't the man to lead the party into the next general election. He was not a winner. He was a loser. And I think he's a much bigger loser today than he was uh, back then. And I think that what he's simply trying to do now is make the best of a very, very bad job by trying to drag uh, Boris Johnson down with him when he finally and eventually and inevitably goes. Indeed. Trevor Kavanagh, the Sun's highly respected political columnist, thank you so much. Apologies for the audio issues there. But it's time now to reveal today's greatest Britain and union jackass. Carol Malone, your greatest Briton, please. OK, I'm going to go with Dennis Waterman. You know, he died at the weekend. He was only 74, to no age at all. He was a great, much-loved actor. And his skill was that he was kind of... He was every man. People felt like they yep. knew him. And I grew up with him, you know, in the series, yeah. you know, Mind Us. Very sad Netflix, loss, very, very indeed. Sad. Benjamin Butterworth, your nominee. Uh, my greatest Briton is Keir Starmer, Sir Keir Starmer. Today! Yes, because he has shown backbone and principle Oh, by oh, saying dear, that mate. he will resign if he's found guilty. OK, that Something is Something I farcical. wish our Prime Minister could do. Utterly farcical. Bev, Bev Turner, save me. Uh, Will Young, singer Will Young, he's done a documentary detailing his late twin brother's addiction to alcohol and eventual suicide, and particularly after we saw the spike in suicides and... Uh, 
and alcoholism okay. after lockdowns. Well, of course, program. today's greatest Britain must be Dennis Waterman. Very sad loss. Union jackass time now. Quickly, Carol Malone, your nominee. Well, mine is all the greedy lefty lawyers currently trying to scupper Pretty Patel's Rwanda plan. These lawyers have enabled the people smugglers and who are now advertising on TikTok for 5,000 quid crossings. Shocking. And they're telling people, don't worry Disgusting. about Rwanda. It's a complete disgrace. Ben no one will send you your there. nominee. Prince Harry for doing that cringe for the advert. <laughs> He's become a trash merchant and it's yeah. painful. Yes, and Beverly Turner, your unit. Uh, two, actually. Rebecca Vardy and Colleen Rooney, that who are about works. to go to court and waste uh, millions on legal fees of who was right. Whilst, as you said, Dan, there are lots of vaccine-injured people who still have not had their day in court. Yeah, indeed. And... There's going to be lots of revelations about their private lives on both sides that they didn't want out there. Do not go to court, celebrities. It is nuts. I'm going to agree with Benjamin Butterworth. Hey. I'm going to shock myself. <laughs> this hardly ever happens. But of course, today's union jackass is Prince Harry for that mortifyingly cringeworthy advertisement. Fabulous superstar panel tonight. Benjamin Butterworth, Beverly Turner, Carol Malone. Thank you so much. I'm, of course, going to be back again tomorrow night from 9pm. Very important discussion, actually, as I said, about uh, that vaccine damage. But up next, it's headliners. Thank you so much. Hello again, I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. It's been a wet start to the week for Scotland and Northern Ireland. That rain is now sinking south, sky clearing behind it, but with further showers expected over the next few days for northern parts of the UK in particular. Low pressure towards the northwest is sending a couple of weather fronts southwards across the UK. Those weather fronts, as they bump into high pressure further east, weaken. But nevertheless, still a cloudy night to come for much of England and Wales. Increasingly damp conditions for northern England, the Midlands, Wales as well. That rain reaching the southwest by dawn. Otherwise, uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland see the rain clearing and clear spells, but with showers replacing it. Those showers particularly lively for the west of Scotland, along with a blustery breeze. 8 Celsius in Glasgow first thing, 14 for London, but a damp start for London as the cloud and rain slowly clear here. By lunchtime, most places sees, see brighter skies and there'll be some decent sunny spells in the south with highs here of 18 to 20 Celsius. Showers for Wales and Northern England, but some lively downpours for Scotland and Northern Ireland. The old rumble of thunder is possible with some of the heavier downpours.